Okay, let's go ahead and get started for the day. Uh, this is class four of concurrency. And today we're going to do kind of two things. One, we're going to talk about motivations for concurrency. Um, and then we're going to look at uh, how a certain kind of mechanism uh, called locks work. And locks are kind of a programming topic, um, a way to control the concurrency without just using a software only solution like we saw with Decker's algorithm, Peterson's algorithm. But with locks uh, are basically an alternate mechanism to control synchronization between two concurrent processes. Before we do that, let's dig into that. So an overview of what we're going to do today. We're going to discuss that concept of effective orderings again. Uh, we're going to discuss motivations for concurrent programming, like why are we putting ourselves through this uh, if it has that non-determinism and difficulties. And then we're going to look at using locks to protect critical sections uh, to control that uh, in cases where there would be something that was dangerous. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So first off, uh, a review of that uh, concur concurrency and non-determinism we said all right, we have two sequential processes in this case, A and B. A has N instructions, B has M instructions. We run them concurrently. That means they're allowed to overlap. Uh, so what are all the ways they can overlap or what are all the possible orderings of those instructions we could get if those two processes are executed concurrently? And what we saw was that, well, with uh, one and one, there are only two orderings. It could be this way, it could be that way. That's it. With one and two, there are three orderings, so like that like that, and like that. Uh, with two and two, there are six, and you could go through and figure all those out. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, I think I got all of them there. Two and three, you get 10. Three and three, we got 20. And we wrote all of those out previously. And uh, three and four, we could figure out. But you'll notice how that, that, how that increases exponentially. Uh, and we could also extend it to more than two processes, so we could have three. And as the, we had that bonus challenge where I asked you to say, okay, well, if we have just two processes and we know the number of instructions of each, N and M, how do we compute the number of effective orderings? And so I asked you to email it to me once you had an answer uh, for an additional two bonus points. So, well, how do you extend it to three processes or for any number of processes? And we do have a winner. Uh, so somebody did uh, email me the correct uh, answer. Actually, a couple people did. Uh, there were a few people that emailed me the uh, correct answer. Only one person was first, however. Uh, and so let's actually take a look at how that works. So the idea is that this is a formula that works. There are other uh, ways you could express this as well. But this one is fairly succinct and makes sense. So N and M, the formula for that is N plus M that quantity factorial divided by n factorial times m factorial. Now, why does that work? Well, if you just say how many combinations of, uh, if you have n and m items, how many combinations of them are there? Well, you just say n plus m and take factorial. So this is how many total combinations there are. But the problem with doing that and just that is that and some people were close. They had this in it, but they had something else that made it wrong. But they have, if you have this, n plus m, that quantity factorial, that's number of total combinations. But that includes combinations that have the uh, a, let's say the, the sequence for a in the wrong order. In other words, a1 always has to come before a2, has to come before a3. You can't have a2 first or a3 first or any of the other things first. And so what we need to do is divide out all of the uh, orderings that are in the wrong order, all the ones that have A in the wrong order. Well, how many of those are there? Well, if we think of how many orderings there are for just A, well, there's N factorial. So there's only one of those that we want. So there's one over N factorial of those that are correct. So that's what, where this term comes from. And there's also one over M factorial of ones that are correct with B in the right order. So we have to divide out both this and this to get only the ones where A is in order, only the ones where B is in order, but still have all the other combinations with the ones divided out we don't need. So this, notice that that could easily be extended uh, by having N plus M plus P plus Q, that whole thing factorial divided by all of those multiplied together. All right, let's try a few of these. And you'll notice that when we go to four and four, we get 70, we go to 10 and 10, 
we get 184,756. We get uh, 20 and 20. We get 137, what's that, billion, 846 months. And notice how quickly that grew uh, from where we, back here where we had just like, where, where we just had 20. Notice how quickly that grew into this very, very large numbers. And if we keep going with that, uh, if we have 100 and 100, suddenly we have 9.05 uh, times 10 to the 58. So in other words, move this decimal place 58 places that way. And if we just have, and notice that 100 instructions uh, at the kind of a low level CPU code level is not that many. And if we just go up to 150, 150 instructions and 150 instructions, now we have like, this number, 9.38 roughly, times 10 to the 88th, that number of possible orderings from just these two relatively small programs. So a 150-line uh, program in machine code would be like this much code in a higher-level language. So we're talking about simple per two simple processes running concurrent with one another. There are 9.38. Uh, 3759 times 10 to the 88 possible ways that, that those could overlap each other. And that's incredible. In fact, if we think about this number here, that number there, so even with two relatively small processes like that, we end up with this really large number. And that gives us this really large number of effective, uh, number of effective orderings. In fact, that's over 100,000 times more orderings than the number of atoms in the observable estimated to be in the observable universe. So that's crazy that that, with really simple programs like that, two processes, there's so many uh, effective orderings there. And that is why uh, concurrency is dangerous, and the implication there being you can't predict which ordering you're going to get because it's non-deterministic. You're basically rolling the dice and getting one out of uh, a number that's 100,000 times bigger than the number of atoms in the universe, chance of one of those orderings coming up. So if just one ordering is bad, then the solution is incorrect and could fail when you execute that program. Now, it might work most of the time, but there is a probability that it could fail if we don't uh, use concurrency carefully and if we allow those bad orderings to exist. And it can be dangerous to play the odds there. So even if it's a really unlikely thing to happen, it can happen, and systems can be corrupted or crash or uh, give incorrect answers. So the, the moral of this story is it's dangerous to play the odds. We need to be careful when we're using concurrency. And also notice that with a, such a high number, if you just have one or a handful of those that are uh, dangerous, it might not show up during testing. Testing does not necessarily help if the odds of that ordering coming up, a bad ordering coming up are low, you might not ever see it during testing, but you could see it once the thing's out in the field and planes crash or uh, uh, people get their heads uh, burned with radiation uh, or any other number of bad things that happen if we're not careful. So the moral of this story is we need to be careful as we're writing the code, as soon as we have concurrency, we need to worry about certain types of patterns and then come up with a way to avoid those proactively. Okay, so, but the question that might come up is why go through all of that if it's dangerous? So if it's dangerous and it's non-deterministic, why not just make a sequential solution? Why, why worry about having concurrency at all? If we could just say, well, to hell with it, we're just gonna be safe and we're gonna write our code and that way when we test it, we know it works, we know it works. Uh, and we'll avoid the non-determinism by getting rid of the concurrency. So let's take a quick look at our motivation here. So motivations for concurrent programming. There are really uh, three main reasons. You could uh, subdivide that and get more than three. But the three main reasons are organization. So in other words, the problem at hand is more naturally solved concurrently, maybe easier to think about concurrently. And an example of that would be like a, a game. And we'll be back to that a little bit later on. But for programming games, you might have, well, you have a rendering uh, rate that needs to happen. You also have stuff that needs to be updated with the game logic, and maybe you even have separate non-player characters, and they all need to make decisions and do things, and you have AI that's running, and you have input and output processing that's happening. Maybe you have to deal with a network stream of data coming in and pushing it back out. Um, and so 
a problem like that would be more easily solved concurrently. You make a thread to deal with the rendering, a thread to deal with IO, a thread to deal with the AI, uh, whatever other the thread to deal with the network uh, code and handling that. And then that kind of divides a complicated problem up into separate concurrent tasks that's easier to get your head wrapped around. Uh, another reason, another motivation would be speed up that with distributed computing or multiple cores in a, uh, a machine or even on a single core processor using the resources better so you're not, your code doesn't block and wait for some event and keep everything else from happening. Um, that would be another reason to have to use concurrent programming to speed things up. Make your program run faster, make your performance better. It also might be unavoidable. So certain types of systems like uh, network systems where, or other distributed multi-processing architectures, databases are a good example of multi-user systems. It might be unavoidable that those are, have to be concurrent in some way. That if you're gonna have a network system with two machines, with two different processors, and they have to communicate with each other and talk to each other and uh, cooperate to solve some problem, then you have concurrency. Or even if you have a single system uh, with a single processor and you have multiple applications that need to run in an operating system, uh, I don't know, something like, uh, let's say, Windows and you have a, a browser open and also a spreadsheet open or you're watching a video or uh, in this case, as I'm doing this, I'm recording the video so it needs to get the stream of that, but it also needs to run the, uh, um, the presentation software and move the mouse around when I move it on the screen. Uh, that's another case where concurrency is somewhat unavoidable. You have to have those different processes doing their own things uh, in order to solve the problem at hand. All right, so let's start off with looking at speed up a little bit. All right, so speed up, uh, the motivation for that is CPU speeds were kind of improving or increasing exponentially until sometime between uh, mid 90s and uh, 2000. But once we got to around 2000, uh, the clock speeds kind of hit a wall. And you, you may have noticed that. For example, if you, if you rewind uh, the clock to 20 years ago or over 20 years ago and say, what's the fastest clock speed on a processor? Uh, you're going to get something that is around that uh, 2, 3, 3.5 gigahertz uh, mark. And that was 20 years ago. And if you fast forward to today, what's the fastest speeds of processors uh, that we have now? Well, they're still three point something, maybe four gigahertz. Uh, is there still their fastest clock speed? So the clock speeds have not increased like they were. But if you rewind 20 years before that, uh, let's say 2000. So you rewind 20 years before that back to 1980. We're somewhere around the, uh, let's say, 1980 way back would be back here. We're somewhere uh, below the 10 megahertz. We're like at the original IBM PC was like four or PC XT anyway was uh, 4.77 megahertz. And we went from four megahertz up to 100 megahertz up to four, uh, three and a half, four gigahertz. And notice that that's a X, and notice that this is a logarithmic scale over here. So this looks kind of linear here. Doesn't look like it's increasing, but really if you were to put this on a non-log scale, like a linear scale, this thing would like skyrocket. But then we get up to around 2000 and it flattens out completely. It flattens out into this straight line. Uh, and it's kind of stayed at that clock speed level for quite a while. And the question is like, well, why is that? And really the reason why uh, comes from two things. The first one is, uh, well, both of these are related to physics. So it's really one thing, just physics. Um, but the speed of light has a maximum speed that it can go and nothing can go faster than that. And so when you get up to five gigahertz, uh, if you had a five gigahertz signal, a five, one cycle of five gigahertz, uh, light would only go like 2.4 inches. So really small amount of distance there. And so if you figure a processor has wires inside of it and the, uh, and the electrons, well, they don't need, they don't, they're not really even just light. They have, there's some resistance in there. 
Uh, it takes time for the electrons to go into uh, a transistor or out of a transistor and go onto those little wires and get there. So we're starting to reach the limits of the speed of light, uh, being able to travel from one part of the processor to the other part of the processor when we get up to those high frequencies that we're talking about here. The other part of this is that uh, the electrical charge, the number of electrons on a MOSFET. And the way a MOSFET works is MOSFET is a metal oxide uh, semiconductor field effect transistor. And let's focus on that last part, field effect transistor. What there is is like a little, you can think of it like a plate. It, it, it's really just etched in silicon, but when electrons flow into that, the electrons being there cause uh, the emitter and collector, uh, the other parts of that, that's called the base, the other parts of that transistor, that the electrons being there put, make a charge, which that's why it's called a field effect. They make like a little field around them. And what happens is that field being present allows electrons to flow through the other two things. It's kind of like an electrically controlled switch. But the problem with that is to make a MOSFET work, there's it requires some enough electrons in there to make a field. So it has to have a dimension and has to have enough electrons there to make the field large enough to cause the other ones to conduct. And there's uh, a limit to how few we can require and have it reliably uh, work as a this electrically controlled uh, kind of voltage controlled switch. And that means there's a limit to how small we can make it. You can't have one that works with just one electron reliably, at least not with current technology. So it requires multiple electrons and there's a limit to how small you can make that. And since there's a limit to how small you can make it and as a, it requires a certain number, it takes time for them to build up on that. Uh, the electrons have to travel to get there. So there's a limit on how uh, small we can make it. So it takes time for this to go in there. And we're really, we're at uh, the mercy of physics there. We can't change the speed of light. We can't change the laws of physics. So we, that's why this is kind of plateaued and this ends at like 2000, what, seven or 2008 here. But really this, if we extended that, this would stay constant all the way up through 2020. So it like exponential ramp and then plateaued and stayed constant for the last 20 years or so. And that was because we ran into the speed of light. Uh, we ran into physics. And when you run into physics, the universe isn't going to change itself uh, the way the rules of physics are. Uh, you can't just magically invent something that breaks the uh, laws of physics. Maybe someday somebody will exploit quantum behavior or something like that. and Quantum computers will become commonplace. But for right now, we've reached those limits on that. So the question is, once clock speeds hit that wall of physics, the immovable wall of the laws of physics, uh, what's the solution to improve performance? How do you get more performance out of a system when you can't run the clock any uh, faster? And the answer to that is you add more cores. So uh, you'll reach the limit of what one worker can do, add more workers and have them working together. And if you look at uh, some systems like multiple core CPUs, uh, multiple core CPU based systems uh, like the AMD Ryzen or Epic uh, series, uh, those have some of them 32 cores, some 64 cores, uh, even mobile phones now uh, have multiple cores in their processor architectures. Uh, and you can have anywhere from like uh, old school one core, one single processor to two to three to four, all the way up to, uh, I believe the highest one, at least when I made this, or looked this up was the uh, Intel Xeon uh, Phi or Phi, depending on who you are, not Phi or Phone. Uh, but the Intel uh, Xeon Phi uh, has up to 72 cores available. And so essentially what they did is those cores still run at that three gigahertz or whatever, some of them below that, uh, three point something gigahertz. But some of them might run up to four point something gigahertz, but they're adding more and more of these processing cores. The other uh, way of approaching this is to get higher speed is to have actual multiple processors, maybe even with multiple cores. And that brings us to something like distributed computing models or cloud computing, where you have, uh, for example, when you perform a, a Google search, you're not just running that on one computer something sitting somewhere. It's running on a whole cluster of uh, distributed uh, machines that are all on a network. 
And so it kind of farms out the problem and breaks it up into smaller sections and then it reports back the answers and then it eventually shows back up on your browser. And without that, you can imagine how long it would take to search through every page on the internet with keywords and search terms and get an answer if it wasn't in a distributed model like this. And really, in those distributed models, those multiple processors even have multiple cores inside of them. So we have this like massively uh, distributed system for handling those things. Okay, so here's one other chart before we move on. Uh, so you'll notice that the clock frequency, here you can see it, like, and this has a smattering of results on there. You can see that leveling out. And again, this is a logarithmic uh, scale. So this is 1, this is 10, that's 100, 1,000, 10,000, and so forth uh, going up here. And you'll notice this is in megahertz. So down here, we had like 1 megahertz. So back in the early 70s, we had the first processors ran, if we follow the frequency here, they ran less than 1 megahertz. And then we get up here, finally we have a processor over 1 megahertz, we get up to 1980, and we're somewhere not at 1, but up here is 10 megahertz, so we're below 10, actually below 10 still, all the way up until we get to uh, the mid 80s. So here's like 86 or 86, 87, somewhere around there. Now we have something that's running at 20 megahertz. And then we when we get up to here, uh, finally in like the 90s, we're now up to like 100 megahertz. We get to 95, we have some things that are running at 200 megahertz and so forth. But you'll notice that this tops out and then it kind of levels off. And if we were to continue this, this data ended at uh, 2010. But if we were to continue that, this graph here would have completely flatlined for megahertz around, for the megahertz around that 3 gigahertz uh, range. Right, uh, right about there, right about the middle of this line. But one of the things you'll notice is the number of cores. Uh, once we hit that point where this flattened out, they start adding multiple cores. So you wind up with uh, here like two cores and some of these and four and eight and so forth. And then up here we now have over 10 cores and some of these. And if you continued that, the number of cores would have exploded. Not We're not up to over 100 yet but we're up in the higher ends of this in the 50s and 60s and 32. So the number of cores and the processors you'll see on the, that show up on this chart, especially ones for things like PCs or servers, you'll see very few of them that are single core anymore down here. They've all kind of moved up to adding multiple cores. Also, you'll notice that the, uh, the single thread performance, meaning each core that has leveled out because that was a function of clock speed. But if you look at the number of transistors that are used inside of those, as you add twice as many cores, you need more transistors inside that processor. So you'll notice this has continued to kind of increase. Uh, so if you think about a 72 core uh, processor, it's got 72 duplications of the processing unit, the CPU, the ALU, uh, and then it also has additional electronics that are needed to farm things out and manage those and have a memory access to all those cores and make use of all those cores. So the number of transistors um, is now way up here somewhere and we started adding cores to these things. So this is important to understand that parallel processing or concurrency becomes more important if we want high performance. But this thing in bold face down here at the bottom is important. The extra cores or additional CPUs or a distributed computing model only helps if we can run things uh, or if we write our codes that takes advantage of them, or if it's a problem that can be uh, written in such a way that takes advantage of them. So if you have an uh, inherently sequential process, uh, an inherently sequential algorithm, it's not going to help to run it on a really high-end, uh, like, multi-core uh, system. It's just not going to make it any faster. It's going to be as fast as it is. And the converse of that is if you take a program that's not written to be uh, concurrent or not written to be parallelized, it's just a sequential program, you wrote it and compiled it to be as such, running it on a higher uh, end CPU with more cores isn't going to make it any faster either. It might make it a little faster because you can dedicate the other cores to doing 
operating system tasks or other things and dedicate a single core for that, but it's not really going to be any faster uh, on a system that has no other software running on it. So we need to think about writing our code uh, in such a way that can take advantage of that multi-processing or concurrent or distributed system. And if we can't, it doesn't do us any good. So in other words, back to our question about why concurrency. Well, if we're interested in making a program that is fast and responsive, then there's not a whole lot of uh, wiggle room if we don't embrace some sort of concurrent uh, method of solving that. And so you, if you take a pro problem like, uh, I don't know, let's go back to like a, an internet search engine. And you say, you know what, concurrency is dangerous and it has this non-determinism, and I want to get rid of that, I'm going to implement that in a single, as a single program, a single algorithm running on just one computer. You're never going to get an answer. Uh, or it's going to take so long, it's going to be useless. Nobody's going to use that search engine. Okay, now, there is a way to measure speed up, and so I want to spend a couple minutes talking about that. So speed up is essentially considered like a factor. Uh, speed up is a factor of how much faster uh, a program is. And so if we look at the, and this, this is once we run it in a concurrent or a parallel uh, execution fashion. So the sequential execution time, we're going to define that as T sub S. The parallel execution time, we're going to define that as well as T sub P. So if we compare the sequential execution time and compare that with the parallel execution time, we can come up with a factor of how much faster uh, one is than the other. So let's, the way we do that is we just take TS and divide it by TP. So if these were the same, you'll notice we'll get, let's say they're both 10. So this took 10 seconds, the parallel one took 10 seconds, we get a speed up of 1.0. In other words, it didn't speed it up at all. But if the execution time for the parallel version was twice as fast, let's say this took 10 seconds, this took 5, we'll get a speed up of 2.0. So a speed up of 2.0 means the code ran twice as fast. A speed up of 1.0 means it didn't run any faster. Speed up of 0.5 means that it actually slowed down, that we actually hurt performance by making it parallel. And that can happen sometimes. Now, so if fully utilized, we have n cores, that would make TP take TS over n time. So in other words, if I have that, a perfectly parallelizable system where I can say, I've got a thing that takes 10 seconds and I've got 10 processors or 10 cores, it'll take one tenth the amount of time. So you think, think about that like a, a worker. You're digging fence posts and you say, well, I've got 100 fence posts. It takes me 10 minutes to dig a hole for one fence post. So I'll get 100 of my friends and we'll all dig one of the fence posts. It'll still take 10 minutes. So uh, rather than the time it would take me to do the whole thing. So my speed up in that case, 100 posts, 100 people, would be a speed up factor of 100, like we see here. So the speed up uh, of that would actually be n. It'd be 100. Two people, speed up of two. It's twice as fast. 100 people, speed up is 100. 100 times as fast. But there's a little bit of something that's missing in this. Uh, that kind of, That's a very naive approach to looking at that. And the thing is that some problems can't be paralyzed, or they can only be partially paralyzed not paralyzed, parallelized. <laughs> paralyzed means something else. Uh, but if they can only be partially parallelized, then how do we come up with a speed up for something like that? And so the way to do that, we're going to take a quick look at that. And the idea there is we can divide the program up into some sections. A part that has to be sequential or can't be parallelized. And that would be things like initialization, starting the program up, uh, dividing the problem up for the tasks, handing it out to the tasks, any kind of I.O., getting information from the user, reading files, uh, at least initially, to get things set up, and then taking the results that come back from all those tasks and putting them back together into one answer. That would be a sequential part. Now, the part that can be parallelized, code that, I mean the code that can be run concurrently, that would be the individual tasks being run on the individual cores or individual processors. So if we can divide it up into those parts and come up with a percentage and say that like some percent of the program is sequential and has to be, some part can be run uh, concurrently with other parts, then we can actually come up with a measure of what the speed up, we, what speed up we could expect from that. 
All right, so here's what, uh, let's take an example of a program that is 10% sequential and 90% parallelizable. In other words, 90% uh, of it can be run concurrently uh, on multiple cores. And 10% of it has to be sequential. That'd be like the startup code, the initialization, and at the end, gathering the results and presenting the answer. Maybe saving the answer to a file. All right, so the question here is what speed up will we get if we have n cores on a program that looks like this? So let's go through that. So remember, speed up was ts over tp. In other words, the sequential time divided by the parallel time. And if we actually plug in that, so 0.1 is 10% that was sequential plus uh, 0.9, there's the 90% that's parallelizable. So in other words, this 0.1 cannot be divided by n down here in the parallel implementation because that's the 10% of it that has to be sequential. Dividing that by n doesn't make it any faster. We can only use one core for that, so 0 0.1 is we're stuck with. But this 0 0.9 over here divided by n, we are not stuck with that. We can actually make that faster. All right, so if we compute this, Let's plug in some numbers and give a different number of cores and see what our expected speedup would be. Okay, again, here's the, the formula we're using and is the number of cores. So let's start off with n equal two. So with two cores, we get one divided by 0 0.1 plus 0 0.9 divided by two. And the result we're gonna get from that is 1.8. Uh, so with two cores, we get something that's almost two times faster but not quite. We're what uh, a little bit short, less than 0.2 short for that. So we're like, in this case, you can think of this as about 82% faster than the uh, sequential only. So we used two cores. We got a good improvement, 82% improvement, almost 82% improvement in speed. Ran almost twice as fast. So now let's uh, solve that for four cores. So now we use four cores for that. And you'll notice we plug in a 4 down here, do the same calculation. Now we get 3.076. Now we have something with 4 cores that's a little bit over 3 times faster than it would be with just one processor. Let's do it with 8 cores. So with 8 cores, plug in the 8 down here. 4.7 times faster. So with 8 cores, we're not, we're a little bit over 4.5 times faster, but not really uh, to uh, 5, so 4.7 times faster than we were with one processor. Now we might say, well, what happens if we just throw a whole lot of hardware at this? Let's, let's throw uh, an infinite number of cores at this. If we had this giant distributed system with an infinite number of uh, processors or a processor with an infinite number of cores, we could use all of those to uh, throw at this problem. How much faster could it ever be, theoretically? What's the limit to that? All right, so with n equal infinity, we have 1 divided by 0 0.1 plus 0 0.9 divided by infinity. That The limit of that approach is 0. So we have 1 divided by 0 0.1 plus 0 is the limit of that. So 1 divided by 0 0.1 gives us 10. So the best we could ever do on this particular algorithm, no matter how much hardware we throw at it, is a 10, uh, tenfold improvement. So if it took uh, 10 seconds before, it'll take one second now, but throwing more hardware at it is not going to help. It's not going to make it any faster. And notice that that's a little bit of a uh, bleak if you think about that, that the, if you think about that, that we just threw an infinite, we might say, we have this program, we need it to run faster, throw more hardware at it. Well, you can keep throwing hardware and keep throwing hardware, but there it becomes like a law of diminishing returns that you're going to get the more hardware you throw at it, the you would think, well, it'll add 10 processors, it'll be 10 times faster. Add a million processors, processors, it'll be a million times faster. But notice that the limiting factor for how much improvement we can get is the sequential part of that algorithm here, that we cannot, adding extra processors or extra cores isn't going to help. So we're stuck with this limit of a tenfold improvement, which is based on that 10% of that that's sequential.
So that means even with an infinite number of uh, processor cores or processors, we're only going to get a tenfold improvement here because of that 10% sequential nature of that. All right, so the takeaway from that is we need algorithms that minimize the sequential part if we expect to see large performance gains. So we need to have solutions that are more and more concurrent and less and less sequential if we want to see huge performance uh, gains. And think of how slow a Google search would be if it were 100% sequential. You're searching through the uh, billions of pages that are on the internet and doing a keyword search that has multiple terms and then have to present the results. And you have, not only that, but you have to rank the results as which one's the most relevant uh, to the question you're asking. You have to keep track of that those results, not just one, but a bunch of them, and then page after page of those. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done there with the amount of things. So imagine how slow that would be if it were 100% sequential. You'd ask a question, you might not get an answer uh, in your lifetime uh, if you're running it purely on just one processor. But the good news is that's a kind of task that can be distributed. You could divide that up and say, well, it's obviously sequential on your browser when you type in the thing and it sends off the one request, but then once it hits Google with the request, it farms that out to this giant cloud, uh, uh, giant cluster of network nodes that each have their own pages that they've indexed and their own things, and it gathers the results from those. And then that filters up to another layer of the cluster that then uh, combines the keyword things, and that filters up to another layer of the cluster. And so it's like having, it, it's really incredible if you think of a keyword search. Uh, the incredible part of that is thinking about how much processing power went into you doing a quick Google, Google search for like cat memes or something like that, and how much uh, they've optimized that to give you that. And part of their optimization is to make the, uh, the sequential part as small as possible and parallelize everything else uh, as much as possible. And so the thing that I want you to think about is that how much different the world would be if we did not have this distributed system model like for search engines or other uh, cloud-based systems. If everything were just purely implemented sequentially, we wouldn't have web search. It would be uh, very difficult to get anything out of that. And you can even see that on your local PC. Uh, if you have a, a local PC and you do a search for a file, the storage space on your, I don't know, on your laptop is like, what, a terabyte? You compare that to, uh, it'll take your Windows machine, I don't know, if you have a, a terabyte worth of storage and a good number of files, it might take, uh, I don't know, it could even take like an hour or more to search for a file on your computer. And then think about Google can search every web page on the entire internet that's been indexed by them, which is just billions and billions of pages with, uh, I don't know how many exabytes of, of data they uh, search through, but they can do that in like a tenth of a second instead of an hour. All right. Now, even without speed up though, concurrency still can be useful for organizing code into tasks. And again, think about like a, a game, like a game program. So that's something that are kind of naturally concurrent solutions and some benefit programs can benefit from organizing those solutions as a set of concurrent tasks. And you think about a game, you have like the rendering loop that has to happen. Get the objects in the game, update the stuff in the graphics hardware, uh, render everything, render the 3D geometry, render the heads up display, whatever. And that has to happen at a kind of regular interval uh, or the game seems uh, sluggish. And so you also have audio that's streaming out that has to be streamed out. And you don't want the audio stream to be interrupted by other things that are happening and have the audio stutter uh, or cut out partway through or pause. You don't want to have the rendering pause. You want to have that stuff seem fluid and smooth. And you might want to have some complicated AI deciding what to do and how to attack you and how to do things. And so you don't want to have this limit, the 
complex you have that limited to making sure you can render new audio. So you might have a complex function call to do the AI stuff for the non-player characters. Uh, you also have network. If you have a networked game, you have the other player data streaming in that needs to feed into the uh, local game state and then update the rendering. Uh, input controls, when you press keys, they need to do something and be processed or click on the mouse or move the mouse or whatever. And then the game logic itself. When you uh, pick up this key, it gets added to your inventory. When you uh, uh, hit this button, uh, this door opens up or it unlocks some other part of the game. We need to have all of that stuff. And if you put that all into one um, game loop, suddenly you have the timing of the AI and the game logic affecting how it looks and how it sounds and uh, the stuff coming in over the network affects or might pause the input controls and you don't want that. So this is a kind of uh, case where it's natural to solve this in a concurrent way. Make the rendering loop, just take the game state and render it. Make the audio, just take whatever happens and feed the audio to the speakers and stream that out. Uh, the AI, let it think about what's happening, let it make decisions that change the game state that then gets rendered and so forth. And this can be thought of, you can think of this on a lot of things as well. So for example, not just a game, but like a uh, embedded system in a factory controlling a machine or a automotive system that's monitoring your car. It's monitoring engine parameters uh, and some of the engine parameters change quickly. Uh, I don't like the, maybe the signal from an airbag sensor needs that needs to be looked at really quickly but other things might take more time like the gas gauge level you might want to smooth that out so the gas gauge isn't like bouncing up and down as you're going around corners uh, and so to do that it's natural to divide that up into different tasks update the gas gauge slowly kind of smooth that result out but you don't want to be stuck in some loop somewhere doing that and the person crashes their head bounces off the steering wheel, they go through the windshield, and then half a second later the airbag goes poof for no reason. And so the idea there is we need to have certain things have a high priority and have their own task that just monitors them. Certain things have a lower priority. And those types of systems tend to use what's called a real-time operating system as opposed to an operating system like Windows. And real-time operating systems are essentially uh, concurrent operating systems that can guarantee uh, responsiveness for certain tasks. In other words, rather than just saying, oh, I'll get to it when I get to it, uh, they can say this task will run at this rate and it's guaranteed that it'll run at that rate. And then there are also, like we mentioned, some inherently concurrent problems. If you think about anything on the internet, uh, like YouTube, how many people are watching videos right now on YouTube or uploading videos? Uh, that's an inherently concurrent system. Multiple, any multi-user system like that, or Google search, we mentioned that. Any system where multiple uh, subsystems have to communicate with each other. Like, I don't know, like the, the Mars rover uh, sending data back to uh, the, a system on Earth that's reading that uh, communication. Well, that's the kind of case where it's inherently concurrent. You cannot uh, have a sequential system whenever you have communication like that. Okay, so there are clearly some benefits uh, to concurrency. Uh, and sometimes not only does it have benefits, but you can't get away from it. If you have a networked system, two systems that talk to each other, you're stuck with concurrency at some, in some form or another. And so as a reminder, we need to be aware of the dangers of it as we make those concurrent systems, and we need to know how to eliminate them. So if we look at a mechanism for fixing the concurrent update problem uh, today uh, that we saw last time, then we're just going to look at one of those today. That's going to be uh, what are called locks. And the concurrent update problem is that problem that we saw in the ornamental garden problem, where concurrent update is there's two different tasks or processes trying to update some shared variable in this case, the resource. And the ornamental garden problem is the count variable. You had the enter turnstile and the exit turnstile trying to concurrently update the count uh, value. So you add to it, take away from it. At the end of the day, you should have zero if the same number of people came in as went out. But with the concurrent update problem, we could have that case where you wind up with either an exit being lost or an enter being lost or more than one enter or exit being lost. And so that's what we're going to look at, is protecting that critical section of that update um, in some way. 
Okay, so that brings us to locks. And locks in Python uh, are a mechanism for fixing that concurrent update problem. Uh, and they're a fairly simple synchronization mechanism that has two operations, lock.acquire or acquire and release. So what happens with acquire is we say, when you hit this line of code, we're going to try to acquire this lock. And if it's not available, we have to stop and wait. We block and wait. And then when we hit the, if we do acquire it, we use the lock as we're in the critical section of our code. And then we exit the critical section of the code, we release that lock. So this is very similar to what we saw with Peterson's algorithm and Decker's algorithm, where they had that variable of uh, like P1 wants inside equal true. And then they use the critical section where then they say P1 wants inside equal false. So it's similar to that, except that we don't have to do this with shared variables. We're doing it with this mechanism, this object. So let's look at how we would use a lock in Python. So in Python, uh, for the threading uh, module, threading has its own lock uh, mechanism. And it's a lock object. And we create an instance of a lock object by doing, we'd have to have imported threading already, import threading. And then down here, threading.lock. Notice the capital L, that's because lock is a class. And so now this is a lock object. So once I've created a lock object, I can use it by saying, my, the name of the lock dot acquire, and that's a method of that lock object. And if we hit this and it's already acquired by somebody else, we block. If we hit this and it's not acquired, we acquire it, we enter the critical section, and we're done. We put it back by saying, oh, that should say release there. Let me fix that. Okay, and so we acquire it, we release it. And we put any critical section code inside of here that we only want mutually exclusive access to. So there is another way to use the locks as well. Uh, and the other method of using locks, you don't have to explicitly call acquire and release. You can just basically say, use this with block. So you can say with my lock. And then you put your critical section inside of here, and it will be acquired before entering this indented code, and it'll be released when we exit that uh, indented code. So that's a little more structured. Uh, that would prevent things like the mistake I made back here with acquiring, trying to acquire twice, which would lock up the program. This it acquires and releases automatically. So it's a little bit more structured, but it might be a little less clear since the locks acquisition and release uh, are implicit. No, notice nowhere do we see an acquire or release here. It's just done with that lock. But it does, however, ensure that a lock can't be acquired and then accidentally never released uh, like we had with that typo I'd made on the previous page. And so I'll leave it up to you. Uh, there are cases where you don't want to use a with block where you want to acquire it in one place, release it somewhere else rather than surrounding a critical section. That's uh, a different type of problem though than we were looking at with a critical section. Um, so you can use either this or you can put wrap the critical section with an acquire and release. Okay, there are some other synchronization mechanisms like this that we're going to see uh, later on in the course. Um, but we need to have synchronization mechanisms in order to eliminate those bad orderings in order to avoid things like that concurrent update problem causing the count value to be corrupted. And later in the semester, we're going to look at some other mechanisms, R locks, which are recursive locks, semaphores, uh, barriers. There's, there's a number of these synchronization mechanisms that we're going to look at. We'll look at those more on or more later on in the uh, semester. And one thing to note here with this uh, acquire and release, how simple that is, that we can just wrap that around a critical section. This is called a synchronization mechanism. Because what we're doing is we're, think about this as kind of like a, a lock on a, a bathroom door or something like that. You say, hey, I'm going to use the bathroom. The first thing I do when I go in there is lock the door. And then I, when I'm done, I unlock the door and I leave. So this is kind of like the thing that keeps, uh, synchronizes the processes so that only one at a time is ever in the critical section. Because without these, they could both enter the critical section and those would overlap and we're not controlling those bad orderings at that point. Okay, so to finish up here, uh, there's a new lab that's been posted. And in lab two, you're going to implement uh, some locks uh, to modify the program you had from lab one. 
So uh, if you edit your code from Lab 1, make sure to do a save as so you don't lose your original source code to Lab 1. Um, but let's go ahead and take a quick look at the assignment. So give me a second here to switch over the, uh, the video. Okay, so here's what Lab 1 is. It's basically the same code we had before. And we're going to be modifying that Lab 1 code for that bank account. Uh, to fix that concurrent update problem that we had before. So in other words, before modifying the program, I want you to run it several times with that deposit 500, withdraw 50, withdraw 10, and note that those incorrect values that are uh, sometimes produced. And so the idea here uh, from what we had in the previous lab is if we don't protect that, we're going to get that corruption of the value from what it should be. And that's especially bad on things like bank accounts because people aren't going to trust your bank if they put in a deposit for 500 and it disappears completely. They might love your bank if they put in uh, or withdraw $50 and that disappears completely. But your bank's not going to stay in business long because you're giving away free money. So the idea here, and the, well then those people will ultimately be unhappy. So first step, note that incorrect values are produced when you do these things. And then I want you to add a lock to the program above in order to protect against that concurrent uh, bank account accesses. So the places you're going to have to put that are going to be somewhere in here around the critical section. And the critical section in this case is going to be from where you get the balance to where you restore it that's going to have to get protected in some way. So you need to protect the method uh, steps inside of here from being interrupted. So in withdraw and in deposit, you're going to have to put a, a lock. Now, one quick thing is, well, where do you put that lock? Uh, what I would suggest doing is making the lock part of the object uh, attributes. So in other words, when you create this in the constructor, you might say self dot and then lock equal threading.lock. So make it one of the attributes. And then inside of the withdraw function, you're going to acquire that lock, get the balance, subtract from it, restore it. You can even log the transaction and then release the lock. And do the same thing with that same lock inside deposit. And notice that make, allows us to make separate bank accounts that each have their own lock associated with them. So you'll make a lock for whatever instance it's part of the thing. And the cool thing about locks is it's uh, not really like a global variable at that point. It's, a, it's an object. It's an entity that handles all that stuff for us. So add the lock. Test the program again by executing it 100 times. Note that there are not going to be or should not be incorrect values. If there are, then you've uh, screwed up the way you've implemented the lock and you need to fix it. And then I have a few questions here that I want you to answer. And you can answer those in the submission thing or you can put them in your a comment at the top of your program that you turn in. And the, I only need one program turned in for this, uh, and that's the one with the locks. You don't have to turn in the one that you did for this because this was already for lab one. But I want to know, uh, was the output correct every time of those hundred? Uh, is the execution still non-deterministic? In other words, does adding those locks make the program no longer non-deterministic? And is it still, are those still executing concurrently? Uh, and the answer to this should be, Yes, it's still concurrent. I'll let you figure out whether it's non-deterministic or not. Um, the execution order, anyway, is it non-deterministic? So did we get rid of the concurrency, or is it still there, but we're controlling it, is what I'm asking. All right, so that shouldn't take you too long if you've done lab uh, one already. Uh, really, there's very little code you have to add for this. And note the due date. That's due next week uh, by the end of the day. So go ahead and get this done. Uh, it should not take you too long to do this. Um, if you don't have done lab one, let's go back to the presentation just for a second. Okay. So really that's all today. Make sure you finish lab one and submit it on blackboard, uh, and make sure you get started on working on lab two. And really you should be able to get lab two. Uh, we've, we've talked for less than an hour today out of the two hours and 15 minutes that we have for this class. So you should be able to get lab one and lab two done and submitted. And rather than procrastinating, I would suggest you use the class time in here to do that. Uh, if you want to go back and look at other parts of the video, uh, you might want to do that. 
Uh, we may have a quiz over some of that stuff. Like I might give you something and say, hey, what's the speed up of this? Uh, have you compute that? Uh, but finish lab one, get started on or finish lab two. Other than that, that's all we're doing today. So everybody stay safe, wear a mask uh, if you're out, um, wash your hands and stay safe. I want to make sure everybody uh, is healthy and happy this semester. And then hopefully uh, by the end of the semester, maybe the world will be uh, in a different state and we can go back to having in-person classes uh, in a situation where we don't have to feel worried about uh, getting sick or making somebody sick. So everybody stay safe and I'll see you soon.